Hello and welcome to this edition of Old Romans Unscripted. Uh, hopefully we'll be joined by uh, uh, some other panellists in due course. There's no one waiting in the green room just now. If you were watching the Screen Fathers, that now is your cue uh, to jump in and join the discussion. Now there's been an awful lot going on uh, in the past week. Uh, those of you who follow our website, www.theoldroman.com, uh, cannot fail, I think, to have been impressed uh, with the uh, number of uh, posts from Catholic headlines uh, that have literally flooded uh, the website uh, uh, this week. Um, we've had... Um, about 2,000 views this past week alone most of course interested in uh, the hot topic of the day which is um, Tradiciones Custodes um, I hope some of you were able to watch uh, last night's programme a new series uh, every Friday evening following the Andrus hosted by Brother Stanislaus uh, where we discussed last night, we began to discuss, I should say, because there's an awful lot uh, to discuss about uh, Tradiciones Custodes, but we, we began last night uh, to discuss uh, the motu proprio uh, in depth, and uh, I, we began that programme with um, a, an introduction uh, about old Romans, about who we are and what we're about. Um, so if you miss that, then please check out uh, www.youtube.com forward slash um, Old Roman TV and uh, you can watch uh, last night's uh, program. Um, but otherwise, I suspect, and um, for those of you who may be despairing of it already, because it is rather as if nobody's talking about anything else, um, I suspect that this is going to be uh, the flavour and topic of our discussions uh, for a long time going forward. Uh, some of you, of course, will notice that I'm in a tropical cassock. Uh, that's not because I am no longer in the UK and broadcasting to you from uh, Central Africa or from the Philippines or anything like that. It's simply because um, today has been a scorcher of a day here in the UK. It really has been uh, really quite hot, quite warm. And frankly, I wanted to put something on that felt comfortable. Um, so uh, that's why, well, even though from here you can't, well, I suppose you can see some of the sunlight um, but it has been a glorious day it was um, uh, a very wet uh, day this morning first thing uh, but uh, through mass actually and onwards uh, it cleared up uh, to a glorious day today so welcome to um, our stalwart followers uh, good evening Peggy welcome to you or good afternoon sorry because uh, I know you're in America uh, good evening Anne of course from Ireland uh, hello Darren, he's in the UK as well, good evening to you, uh, good afternoon Trevor, uh, watching from Washington State, please uh, do feel free to greet us in the comments um, and we will return uh, the compliment um, and please also do feel free during these uh, unscripted programs um, as some of you do, do do you know share your thoughts in the comments um particularly on the youtube platform i know this broadcast is broadcasting across uh, facebook and twitter as well as youtube um but if you're looking for some interaction uh, with other viewers then i suggest uh, looking at uh, youtube uh, where the uh, live chat uh, invariably goes on uh, so do look uh, out for that and do share us your opinions. Sometimes we post them, uh, sometimes we will refer to them. So do share us uh, your thoughts. Good evening, Shirley, uh, there in the UK, just down the road. Uh, good evening, Stephen from Warwickshire, on holiday from Edinburgh. Oh, OK. Uh, good evening and welcome to you. Now, I can see in the green room that uh, Bishop Kelly uh, is patiently uh, waiting so I shall bring him on before uh, we get embroiled uh, in a uh, topic of conversation so here we go hello Bishop Kelly hello there how are you doing 
I'm all right. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, yeah. It, How has your week been? It's been very good, actually. Um, uh, we're enjoying fine weather here. It's gotten a little hot and humid um, past there. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's 95, which I think is 35 in Celsius. Um, but it's the humidity that's 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 the killer. Um, I turned the air conditioning off because it's um, it could be a bit noisy, but I may have to turn it on again. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, please, please feel free. Um, I think I'm I'm probably only in a uh, good mood because um, uh, this afternoon's heat has been dry, um, yeah. as opposed to humid. Um, if there's one thing I I find particularly difficult. Um, it is uh, it is humidity, uh, heat and humidity. It's not a good, not a good um, combination. Um, okay, now uh, so some uh, we've got a bit of an echo going on. That's because I haven't plugged myself in, so I shall do that forthwith. Now and. Bishop Kelly, you're a little low in volume, apparently. Nah. That's the first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just see if there's anything I can do at my end for that. Oh, yeah, I can see what's happening there. So let me do that. We should hear you loud and clear now. OK, so, well, now, um, it broke uh, a week ago or just over a week ago. Uh, Traditiones Custodes, there have been oodles uh, of commentary um, going on um, uh, all across uh, the internet and during the week. Um, we did have some initial reactions uh, last week. Um, Bishop Kelly, have your your thoughts developed uh, since then? Um, no, I think my, my gut reaction to it um, still stands. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of stuff out there, and it um, you're sort of bombarded with it. You can't remember what article said what and where it was uh, said. Uh, you know, I, but I'm s slightly encouraged by the generous response of bishops initially. I mean, that can all change, um, but I have found, found from what I've read, the majority of them have been quite accommodating. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think there have been there have basically been three responses from the bishops. Um, one is stop it now, <laughs> no TLM. Mm -hmm. um, then there has been um, I need time to think about this, mm -hmm. and then I will give you a considered response. And then the vast majority seem to have uh, said um, we maintain the status quo. Uh, what permissions need to be given? Consider them given. Um, and the paperwork will follow in due course, uh, but carry on as you were before. Um, now, it's interesting because, of course, the motor proprio is justified uh, by the Holy Father um, with reference to this survey of uh, the bishops that was uh, conducted just under two years ago, asking them about the traditional Latin Mass in their diocese, um, asking them, you know, um, how often it was celebrated, when and where, so on and so forth. Uh, what were the influences or impacts um, of uh, the TLM in their diocese, etc. Now, interestingly, so this motu proprio that has been uh, sent out and which everyone is agreed um, is outrageous in its content, um, uh, really quite vitriolic, especially the accompanying letter, um, which but all hangs off this Episcopal survey. Now it turns out 30% of bishops responded to the survey. 30% of bishops responded to the survey. And quite obviously from the vast majority of the responses of the Episcopate so far, um, most of the bishops did not have a problem. Most of the bishops did not report back that there were issues about uh, unity within their diocese or that there were schismatic attitudes um, or that um, TLMers were 
uh, you know, consider themselves aloof from the rest of the church or consider themselves to be the one true expression of the church, etc. All of that uh, stuff that was hinted at, well, more than hinted at, um, but, you know, Jacques uh, mm. in the motu proprio um, seem, it doesn't seem to have any foundation in reality. Um, quite clearly that, uh, you know, of the, of the few bishops that responded, perhaps some were negative. Now, interestingly, uh, you perhaps may recall that when that survey went out, um, a lot of people focused on France. A lot of people thought, oh, this 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 will be an initiative by the French bishops. Um, you know, they don't like the TLM because of the SSPX, uh, because of the Integrist uh, uh, attitude or mentality among conservative Catholics, etc. Do you know the first one of the first uh, headlines following the motu proprio the next day was the ex manifest support of the French bishops for the traditional Latin mass communities uh, and apostolates. So irrespective of the fact that, um, you know, in the week preceding, uh, there had been this headline about uh, the FSSP being kicked out of Dijon Archdiocese and all this worry about, you know, whether they should have concelebrated or not the Chrism Mass. Um, by the by, seemingly that's by that was one out of nothing, more or less. Uh, seemingly, otherwise, the majority of French bishops have no problem with the traditional Latin Mass and have given it more or less carte blanche. Um, post the motu proprio have said please continue carry on actually have uh, issued a statement to say we are in support of um, our traditional latin mass communities and those apostolates and religious congregations uh, who support and provide uh, pastoral ministrations and the traditional latin mass in the tridentine formulas clearly there is no problem in france now if there's no problem on france then <laughs> that there is unlikely to be a problem anywhere else. And as you were saying, you know, from the vast majority of the responses of the bishops in North America, um, clearly they don't feel that the TLM is any kind of threat uh, within their diocese. Quite the contrary. Again, most of them have uh, gone for th option three, which is carry on. Please carry on regardless and we'll sort out the paperwork and send it to you as necessary. Um, likewise, in the UK, in Australia, um, again, the bishops on the whole have come out extremely positive, have uh, again said, please carry on. Uh, we will sort out the paperwork and send it to you, you um, as, uh, you know, uh, in due course, but please carry on. So where, where has this problem come from? What is Pope Francis talking about? The whole point of his of his motu proprio is to suggest that there is some big ideological and philosophical and theological problem with uh, traditionalists within the church. There's this schismatic mentality and there are all these people who are claiming to be the true church and don't want anything to do uh, with the unity with the rest of the church. Clearly. Where, I mean, where is he coming from? Well, I think he's coming from the, the canonization of, of Vatican II. I, I mean he sees that as the threat while the novice ordo churches are emptying the tlm parishes masses um uh, fraternities are filling up and he he that's the threat that the council has not been a success um people are voting with their feet um and i mean uh, they have themselves to blame. I mean, they, they call us by being stuck in a rut. At least our rut has a bit of taste. <laughs> Their rut is 1970s. I mean, you still have the same old threadbare vestments that they had in 1972. <laughs> you have the polyester. Same polyester with things on it, un indecipherable um, Symbols, things, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, three-quarter length albs with jeans under them. All this carry on. And the, the come... Uh, fellow, you know, yeah, the, the, guitar sort of, yeah, the guitar, all of that, that doesn't appeal to anybody unless, no. unless you're in your, unless you're in your seventies. Um, and you know, it's, uh, but so from where he's at, he sees that not a sensible bishop in his diocese will say, look, you know, my, the diocesan source of income is coming a lot from these, uh, churches. Uh, from these parishes 
um, the priests, uh, even the diocesan priests who wish to say the Tridentine Mass, are usually workhorses. You know, if the bishop asks them to go to hospital visitations, he'd say, yes, my lord. Uh, if he asks them to say, I mean, they, because they're living out the book. It, it's, it's the pa Father Polyester who's, uh, sorry, Bishop Jim, um, I, I, have a, I have a tea time today and tomorrow and the next day and you know um so i mean they see they see the benefit of whether or not they believe in it or buy into it or probably probably maybe some of them even the ones i i was surprised that that said carry on are probably just being pragmatic pragmatic um um so you know i i think i think francis or and his 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 group of supporters who, who pushed this, um, I think they must be quite shocked. The response, um, you know, uh, I, th I think they must be taken aback because I mean they truly believe in this, um, you know, this Vatican II agenda. You know, the um, I mean they they bought into it. They gave their whole lives to it. Uh, it ha happened when they were probably in seminary or. Um, and it was the excitement of the time, and um, but you know it's very hard to pass on a revolution, uh, even as we're seeing in Cuba now, um, because mm -hmm. the other generations don't have that passion, don't have that excitement, you know, didn't yearn for the change or were blinded, were bought into the ideology, and they're stuck there. They can't stand back and evaluate it. Other generations can, by some buy-in. And some critique, and um, you know that's with the French Revolution. You know, within a matter of years, the monarchy was back. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's um, so it, it's always a pattern, um, and um, yeah, that, that's how I sort of make, try to make sense of it. But um, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. it's. Uh, I d I did hear a lot of this stuff. A lot of the grumblings about it were from Italian bishops uh, initially, um, but even if you look at the response of uh, of some of them and some of the German bishops that you wouldn't think yeah. has been very has been very pastoral. <laughs> Karl Marx, and, and, uh, yeah, and, and the one uh, and the person who hasn't been very pastoral, quite frankly, um, and I'm not accusing him of anything. Just read the letter, um, you know. Um, uh, you know, I think he's got egg in his face in this, and, and he knows it. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I can see uh, Brother Stanislaus is waiting in the wings, so uh, we'll just bring uh, Brother on. Okay. Hello, Brother. How are you? Good, Excellency. How are you, Bishop Kelly? How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Very nice well. to see you Very as well. well. Yeah. Very well. So, um, yeah, so you can guess what we're talking about. Um, so, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we were just, just reflecting how positive, actually, the um, worldwide episcopate um, has been <laughs> in its uh, response to the motu proprio um yeah. and you know most seemingly you know anecdotally but seemingly the majority of bishops responding to their tlm communities saying uh please carry on as you were and we will send whatever paperwork needs to be sorted out in due course mm -hmm. I, I think you know my opinion on that <laughs> uh, i think it's a trick i think um <clears throat> francis and the bishops are playing sort of good cop bad cop and Francis gave him what they wanted. He's the bad cop. He didn't. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. Uh, that's been obvious over the years. And so now all these bishops have the ability to pre to um, present themselves as pastoral towards the communities that have been suspicious of him anyway. And so for me, uh, I can't speak for all the bishops, but you watch over time. Uh, what I foresee is something like um, the Latin mass communities are not going to change. They've been the same. I think Bishop Kelly was speaking to this. You know, they keep doing what they're doing, and 
Okay, but let's say, let's just give it eight weeks. Let's give it 12 weeks because the bishop, a good a bishop might say, it's been 12 weeks now. How are you guys coming along with coming along? And the Latin mass communities are going to say, oh, we haven't changed anything. And then they're going to throw those statements out. The priest delegate's going to stop in and say, you must be conforming towards the only right, the only Roman right. Uh, the Archbishop and I talked about this uh, in our show yesterday. And uh, I think I'm, it's nice to see all these bishops saying, okay, do what you're doing. I mean, I think the most um, in-depth was um, Poprochki, I'm pretty sure, um, who, who really kind of hit him back with some cannons. But I think Cardinal Burke is the one, even though I have my problems with Cardinal Burke, he's the one that I think hit um, the real problem is that Francis is the chief legislator of the church, period. It doesn't matter what a bishop might say in his diocese. If Francis, who he gave in, in his, um, I believe it was the letter to all the bishops of the world, he gave his authority to the two uh, dicasteries handling this. And he says that, he says, the CDF and they have my authority. So I envision documents coming out of there from them, they'll now become the bad cop. And so the bishops, uh, and you know, it takes time to what, but the bishops will be telling the Latin communities, well, I'm trying and I'm doing this and I'm looking out for you, but you guys have also got to come along. And once the Latin communities, traditional Latin communities discover that's what's going to happen, then we'll start to see real movement. But right now, and I don't blame them, I, I'm not blaming anybody. Right now, they really all are holding on to these um, pittances that are being thrown at us by these diocesan ordinaries because they now can appear as the good cop. That's just my opinion. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's certainly interesting. And I think, um, you know, as, as I said last night and I said last week and I've said during the week as well, um, uh, the, there is a bigger issue at stake here, um, which at the moment, although they're coming gradually to it, um, most of the commentators uh, are only hinting at, uh, and I think are too afraid um, to state the obvious, which is that ultimately there cannot, ultimately there will always be this tension between the old mass and the new mass until such time as anyone is actually brave enough to take Vatican II by the horns and say, right, let's actually deal with these documents properly. Let's actually give a definitive interpretation rather than an ambiguous one. Um, and let's actually decide, you know, whether uh, a traditional understanding or a liberal understanding is the mind of the church. Now, um, Francis um, has made again this clear in the motu proprio and in uh, the letter. Uh, that from his perspective, uh, a liberal or the progressive interpretation of Vatican II and the Novus Ordo Missae um, are the only valid, legitimate expression of Catholicism in this, the 21st century. That's essentially what he has said. That's what he says. I want you all to sign off on the, on Vatican II, and why I want you to all sign off that you recognize the Ordo Missae, the, the Novus Ordo Missae, mm -hmm. as a valid and legitimate expression of the faith of the church. That's why he deliberately uses the phrase Lex Orandi. Um, and he's, and he, he says, you know, he uses the term unique um, or only uh, between, between the Italian and the, and the English translation. Um, now, I think it was Cardinal Burke um, who opined that it would be interesting to know, to see what the official Latin translation um, actually says and how it reads. Um, I would be, I I would be, I'm intrigued to know how um, modernist uh, 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 prejudice and ideology and bias and vitriol is translated into <laughs> into Latin. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. in an objective and 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 formulaic prose i'd love to see how that translated to latin um but this i think and I, th I think still the majority of commentators are sidestepping it they're all sidestepping it as they have done 
since the council itself let's face it the reason why this confusion the reason why this tension um, has gone on and goes on and exists is because everybody tippy toes around you know the huge great pink elephant that's sitting there in the middle of the room dressed like a unicorn um, it is you know um, what is the faith what is the catholic faith now i posted on um the old roman.com uh yesterday a uh, brilliant interview um between william f buckley and michael davis and a monsignor chaplain um from 1980 who in 1980 were having this exact same discussion about what is in fact the, the the episode was entitled the fight for the orthodoxy of catholicism and that's exactly the same they were having exactly the same discussion as basically we have all been having this past week because this is what it really boils down to what is the catholic faith what is the catholic interpretation of um the council um what is how are we supposed to uh, appreciate the novus ordo missi now of course clearly pope francis wants us to appreciate the novus ordo missi um as um, a legitimate uh, continuance of the perennial exorandi of of the church which of course it isn't that's obvious to anybody um but also he wants us to all to believe the lie and this is what really gets me this is an emoto proprio from the pope lying saying that the novus ordo missi is the mass of the council it's got nothing to do with the council nothing to do with the council the novus ordo missi has nothing to do with the council sacrosanctum concilium the uh doc the, the, the document from vatican ii about uh the uh ref about the reform or the suggestions of reform um, that might be made to the liturgy say nothing about the um, reform um, that uh, took place in the little committee headed by uh, Annibale Bunini uh, with a mixture of Catholic and six Protestant ministers who came up with and devised uh, the Novus Ordo Missae. And yet Pope Francis wants us to believe that the Novus Ordo Missae is the mass of the council. That this is what the Concilia Fathers of Vatican II, this is what they, it, it's them, you know, it's the Concilia Fathers of Vatican they came up with the Novus Ordo Missae. This is their mass. That's what he's trying to tell us in the Motu Proprio, trying to force uh, what is an historical, um, um, it, it, it's, not a, it's, a, it's not fact. It's not fact. <laughs> it's complete fiction. Now, the problem with that is, of course, if you how can you how can you come to the truth? How can you come to a consensus a, or even a census fidelium on what is the true Catholic faith based on a lie, on the premise of a lie like that? Well, you can't. Um, That's right. You can. And it's, you know, it, um, if anyone wants to know um how the the council envisaged uh, a reform of the liturgy look at the 1965 missile i mean that's 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 as close as you're gonna get to excuse me to what the to what the council had uh, had envisaged um but if you look at the 1965 missile and you look at the 70 missile i mean they're two different horses i mean it's uh, yeah. and then uh, yeah there's no way you can can reconcile it um uh, but the, the, i've heard i've heard this line for years uh you know that the, the this is the mass of the council you know um and i remember maybe around 16 it was an excuse to get out of a we had a um we had a free period um you go to went to the study hall um, but you, two way, three ways you could um, you uh, you could get out of the study hall. Well, well one <laughs> one to get very sick. Second was to ask permission to go to the library uh, to study, um, or um, if you if you were a musician that you could you could go practice. 
Um, but anyway, we're going to the library and then reading the, do the actual documents uh, of the council. Yeah. And scratching my head saying that this is not, this is nowhere near. Um, I couldn't believe it, you know. Um, yeah. it, it's just, it's completely different. But, you know, as, as has been said, that these documents were written with, with little bombshells in them, um, which could be interpreted one way or perhaps interpreted another way. Um, but if, if the, si the side that put them there can detonate them at any time, and you end up with the 1970 missile, and but what the difference between that is and and this this document is that the bombshells are not hidden. And it's back, I think, to what you're saying, yeah. brother. Um, I mean, how do you you know carry on as normal? A lot of bishops have said, and so mass on Sunday, you know, uh, was at St Mary's. It was at the SSPX, uh, you know, um, but the trouble arises when you read the document and said, well, it can't be at any parishes. So mm -hmm. there goes there goes all of your Latin masses, except maybe two if you have the Institute and the FFPX. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's, you can't argue with that. There's ambiguity. You know, he, t he tells, the, uh, you know, again, another contradiction that the, the bishop in this diocese is the arbiter uh, of, of, of the liturgy, all things liturgical. But then he tells them, "Well, you're not because you can't. If you want to have it in the parish, you can't." Um, he's telling the bishops, you know. Um, so it, it contradicts itself. Um, uh, but these, these, these little and um, the other thing too is that any new priest who gets ordained who wants to say it has to apply to to the diocese and wait for it. The bishop could give him permission, but he also has to apply, uh, send it to the Holy See, and that's. What could mix it? I mean, nothing's hid, hidden in this. Um, unlike um, the Vatican, the, the Council documents. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, I too agree. I mean, even if Bishop, you mentioned Bishop Rocky in, in Springfield, um, who's very supportive um, uh, of the traditional Mass. Um, and you know, rightly so. He is, as I said, the arbiter of all things liturgical. All things liturgical uh, stem from him as the pastor in, in the diocese. Um, but Rome has tied tied his hands. He cannot uh, say carry on as before because it clearly says no parishes. Clearly says any of your new priests uh, you give permission to. We got a veto on that, um, and so. Um, those those, well, I mean, those little bombshells that were hidden in the council documents are not hidden here, but they're there. <laughs> I mean, everything everything he, he starts by saying the bishops have the authority to do blah blah blah, and then the next sentence he takes it away and <laughs> says, uh, but has to be stamped rubber stamped by the Vatican. <laughs> yes. um, that's what Cardinal Burke particularly draws out um, mm -hmm. in his statement. Um, that you know, on the one hand, it's uh, you know saying the bishops have the right and the authority to legislate about the liturgy in their diocese and blah blah blah, but then says everything has to be um, mm -hmm. ratified by uh, the curia. Yeah, crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think uh, you know essentially, um, you know that he's you know they say it's a he's trying to be pastoral and he's trying to um, help. These communities out, but that's what I keep pointing to. What Cardinal Burke uh, pointed to, and probably like like most of us here watching, I was waiting for the uh, General Superior of the SSPX to make a statement. I've watched um, the Quebec Superior, the U.S. Superior, uh, this uh, this one, another Superior. I watched all their stuff because you know typically the SSPX, the one thing we can count on is. Um, their men are typically fairly well educated, um, you know. So you can go, and I at least that's how I look at it. So at least I know typically they're like that. That doesn't mean that we're going to get good stuff from them. But so I wasn't disappointed with anybody that I watched. But when I saw the general superior's statement, I was surprised how clear he was. That I'm not. I can't uh, quote him verbatim, but I, the general essence. He said, you know, there's no, there's no longer any debate about hermeneutic of continuity. It's been ruptured, ripped open. This Pope did it. 
There is no continuity. It's clear what's going on here. But he doesn't say what they're going to do, which, you know, um, they can carry on, certainly. But um, at some point, you know, like, a, I, I don't know, there's got to be a better word, I think, but that word defy that, I, that I've used. Uh, at some point, even Petrochki in, uh, in uh, Illinois, um, he can continue to support his communities. And I think it's, it appears that he truly does uh, have, a, have a great love for the traditional Latin mass communities and what they're doing, and he wants them to continue. But that heavy handedness is going to come. If it's not, well, you know, like Bishop Kelly was already said, saying, it's there. There was no secret to this. And so the, the, you know, the bishops who line up more in line with this, they're going to take it. You've seen it already. I'm sure you've seen some of them. They're cutting it out. You know, as we know, there was no uh, vocatio legis. Nothing is now. Do it now. And that's why I think that all of the bishops, well, I should say, I've been warning as many traditional Latin mass goers as I can. That is the little, um, I don't even know what to call it, but you know where it says, do it now. There's no waiting, there's no interpreting, do it now. And But what do the, all these bishops, what do they all say? Well, we want to study it. Well, he already said, there's no, do it now. So I expect whoever he's got in charge of this in the Vatican, which is the two guys from uh, the two dicasteries, um, they're going to start, the letters are going to start coming. There, I have no expectation that there's going to be anything but um, the attempt to wipe out the traditional Latin mass in every diocese controlled by Rome in the world. That's that's what they want to do. Burke said it. Uh, I forget the guy's name who's uh, head of the SSPX. He basically said it. Um, and people, But people are not picking. It doesn't appear to me from what I'm reading that the lay people are picking up on that. When I saw Burke say it, I thought, well, maybe I'll start. To, they're not, I'm not seeing it. Uh, what I do hear mostly is, oh, well, we're going to continue. Oh, thank God this bishop is letting us. And I, I, I just think it's a trick. It was a, an interesting thing I, I, I read. Um, perhaps it was, um, was it yesterday or Thursday? Um, Dominican Fathers in London, uh, I think they're over Taverstock Hill in London, and they have their priory there. And there's a, a young priest, of course, um, who's into the, very much into the Dominican rite of, of, of mass. Mm -hmm. And they have a weekly mass there on Sundays at, at 6 p.m. for the public. It's a sung, it's a sung mass in the, according to the Dominican rite. Uh, his private masses um, at the side altar every day uh, which is open to the public, um, um, uh, are in the uh, yeah. um, the Dominican Rite. So he asked his prior and the prior provincial, and they said, look, you know, just to just to cover yourself, why don't you write to the Archbishop of of Westminster and and uh, you know tell him what's going on and, and ask for permission. He got an immediate response uh, as to carry on. Um, however, what's going to happen? Because, uh, you know, the prior has, can give him permission to, to say Latin Mass in the priory, but it's not just a priory, it's also a parish. So, what's the trumps here, you know? I, I guess it's the parish, and, the, you know, and then the, they could say, well, you know, we'll withdraw from uh, providing for the diocese and return to being a priory uh, church, but then the bishop can say, well, then no public masses whatsoever, mm -hmm. which has been done um, many times before. Um, so it's, this, is, this is full of full of all sorts of things. And I don't know how they're going to sort it out, but I, I do get the impression, as you said, brother, when, when these questions are sent to Rome, um, it's going to be on the negative side. So your bishop may well support, but um, and I, you know, I, I'm try, I was trying to get my head around this, this thing about the newly ordained priest replying to the bishop, and if the bishop says yes, then it has to go to Rome. Now, there are hundreds of them more going to come through Rome. 
they don't know this person from Adam. They don't know, probably half of them don't even know, couldn't point to the diocese on a map. Um, how are they going to make a decision? Well, they're going to make a decision on numbers. You know, if you've got five people there saying the mass in that diocese, you don't need a sixth. So the answer is no. Um, and they're just going to do it. There's going to be a quota, and we'll never know what it is. Just like the results of that survey, we'll never know. And that survey, by the way, could have said anything, but it was ultimately mm -hmm. going to say what what Francis wanted it to say. And we'll never know, and we'll never see it. And if he can lie, in a, if he can lie in a motu proprio, uh, you know, he he can lie about that. Um, mm -hmm. And he's he's not the first pope to do it, uh, just, you know. But um, perhaps he's the first pope to put, put his lie in writing now, or in a motu proprio. But anyway, you know, it's hard to see how this whole thing is going to work, and work now, as you said. Um, well, why why wouldn't uh, Benedict speak out? I'm not so sure. I don't. I don't think that's think he is. way. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I I think I hear God's Rottweiler there. <laughs> as soon as I said that, he started to bark. <laughs> um, well, I think you know. I think Benedict is is too much of a, a gentleman to issue a public uh, statement um, because. Um, I mean, the only statement he could make would, of course, be contradictory to you know mm -hmm. um, what what Francis has said. I mean, he, he can't turn round and say, "Oh yes, Francis is right. I was wrong when I issued some more pontificum." It's just not going to happen. So the only thing he can he can do is um, to stay silent. Um, but of course, you know, this is one of those ongoing um, debates, and some of the commentators have picked up on this. Um, uh, certainly with uh, reference to uh, Quo Primum uh, by St. Pius V, this question of, you know, can a Pope restrict um, or in any way constrain what a future Pope um, can or cannot do or may or may not do? Um, and there's always been this question uh, about Quo Primum where uh, Pius V uh, used the term uh, is quizque whomsoever of the pastors of the church when he was saying you know anathema to those who alter this missal um now perhaps too much of that is being played by some traditionalists uh, because obviously there's no way that um it could be taken in a literal sense but um what is fascinating in this situation is that you know what's never been done before is a reigning pope to contradict his predecessor who's still living <laughs> so, so, so the, the so the question the debate now about whether or not it's okay for a uh, pope to uh, a successive pope to um, contradict his predecessor well that question answered isn't it and <laughs> that's been, that question has been answered um in the lifetime of um of the preceding um pontiff um but of course what commentators, some commentators also said was, but ah, but this also means that should Pope Francis, for example, as he's, you know, spoken of before, should Pope Francis resign? Should he abdicate? Should he become Papa Emeriti like um, Pope Benedict? Um, what's to say that his successor won't turn around and write another motu proprio and say, you know, uh, and, you know, fudge it. Uh, well, as my predecessor, but one said in Samorum Pontificum, and as my immediate predecessor said in Traditionis Custodes, I now say in my, um, you know, motu proprio, blah, blah, blah. The, the point being is, well, hold on a minute. Um, the whole point of being a custodian of tradition, which the popes are supposed to be, is... To maintain the consistency just maintain consistency in doctrine consistency in teaching um where's the consistency if popes now can write motu proprios and and exercise them in the same way that um incoming and outgoing presidents of the united states of america use executive orders you know Yep. Now, a motu proprio yep. is not supposed to be used like an executive order, but that's what Francis has done. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, and a lot of commentators over the years, um, traditional, traditional Catholics have said, you know, they've accused, well, you know, Francis, he's going to come down on the Latin Mass, he's going to do away with all that. And then, oh, no, no, not while Benedict's still alive. Not while, he wouldn't do that, you know. Well, he's gone and done it. Um, but and I was has joking. he gone and done it because he's just had a big operation himself? Well, so that's the rumor. Yeah. He's yeah. Had, they, they fear that, you know, time is short. Um, but I was, as I was saying to a friend uh, during the week, um, and this, this, this seems to be... Uh, an Anglican practice um, when the the vicar goes to uh, to another they they, they call a, an interim while they search for for a, a new rector or a new uh, <laughs> perhaps Benedict could come back as interim <laughs> <laughs> until they elect a new you know it, it really is it, it's really ridiculous the whole thing and it's it's so yeah. not the way of the church it's so not the established way and but again once you start tinkering with one thing you can tinker with anything um so yeah i just uh, yeah. i just highlight this comment there from from trevor uh, he says this is just the the left right blue red paradigm we have in politics actually trevor i know where you're coming from but i'm going to disagree with you because actually this is about the catholic faith or something that is not the catholic faith um, according to Pope Francis, if you do not accept Vatican II and the Novus Ordo Missae, he, he says that the Catholic faith is Vatican II and the Novus Ordo Missae. That's what Francis is basically saying with his motu proprio. And what the majority uh, of traditional Catholics would contend is that mm, actually um, we're not so certain that Vatican II is um, uh, is is. Uh, correct uh, Catholic doctrine um, and the Novus Ordo Missae um, we're not convinced at all that that is um, a Catholic form um, of uh, worship uh, that, that it's a, a Catholic rite or liturgy um, because in its formulation and particularly in what it doesn't say and what it leaves out um, it is you know it's 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 comparable um, from you know, so from a superficial reading of uh, the liturgy of the Novus Ordo, um, it's comparable uh, to the 16th century Book of Common Prayer that was uh, issued by uh, Edward VI after Edward VIII, after Henry VIII. Um, in terms of theology, there is nothing in the Novus Ordo Missae that any uh, Protestant reformer of the 16th century could not agree with. Now, this is in stark contrast to, of course, the mass of the ages that in uh, the 16th century, um, you know, yes, OK, prior to codification by Pius V, but nonetheless, it's substantially the same mass that he would codify subsequently. Um, that was a mass that got the reformers in a tiz, in an absolute tiz was. Um, but Luther um, called uh, the, the Catholic mass all sorts of outrageous um things uh, unchristian things um now so therefore you know so so to say that the novus ordo missi now that it corresponds to the protestant and reformed uh, theologies of the last 500 years to claim that that is a continuation of catholic doctrine um and dogma and belief and prayer and worship and liturgy um, is is a complete misnomer. I mean, it's a, it's a complete lie. You see, this debate at its fundamentally is not about aesthetics. It's not about whether or not I prefer Gregorian chant, fiddleback vestments, lace albs, and Latin as opposed to um, guitars, um, uh, um, polyester fabrics, and um, uh, um, uh, a, a sort of uh, laissez-faire uh, approach to rubrics this is not this is expressly what this debate is not about this debate is is fundamentally about what is the catholic faith and this god bless him is what um don davide pagliari the uh superior general of the sspx um has said in his statement he is basically he has and, and deo gracias i was so pleased 
to read his statement and think, yes, they're still, they're still, they're still in the cause. Um, he he makes the same point. This is not about aesthetics. This is not about uh, left or right. You know, th this is about what is the faith and what is not. And until this is actually addressed, there will always be this tension. There will always be schismatic attitudes um, in in the church. And of course, the irony, the irony of this is, is that um, it is Pope Francis who is manifesting the schismatic um, mentality um, in contrast to the perennial tradition, magisterium and liturgy, Lex or Andy, um, of the church. Um, so bless you, Trevor. I understand exactly. You know, I can I can appreciate where you were coming from. Um, but I would say that this situation is not about is not as black and white as it were left or right in politics as in terms of preferences or choices. It's literally about salvation. That's the main point. It's literally about salvation. The reason why we and the SSPX and the Sedificantis and other people will say um, you should go to the traditional Latin Mass rather than go to the Novus Ordo Missae is because if you go to the traditional Mass, you will get to the traditional teaching, which is not just about what the celebrant says from the pulpit, but it's actually contained within the liturgy itself is the lax the lex credendi of the church the perennial magisterium and faith of the church is expressed in its lex or in its traditional lex orandi if you go to the traditional latin mass you will pray as the church has always believed that's the point if you the reason why we say you should avoid the novus order missi or you are um endangering your soul if you go to the novus order missi because uh, the Mass itself, the text and the form of the Mass itself is in stark contrast to the perennial tradition and liturgy and lexorandi of the Church. You will not get from just reading the Novus Ordo Missae any sense of what the Catholic Church has always believed and taught. Just from, the, just from reading the, the Order of Mass itself and from, uh, you know, the, the supporting uh, lectionaries or whatever. It, it's just not there. And because that mass was deliberately, they deliberately left out any all the sacrificial prayers. They left them out. Uh, look at the look at the prayers of the offertory. Compare the offertory prayers of the Tridentine mass with um, uh, the prayers uh, in the Novus Ordo Missae. In the Tridentine, in the Tridentine, in the traditional Latin mass, the priest is his prayers is about sacrifice it's about accepting this sacrifice we're offering this sacrifice of this immaculate host um which is you know a reference to christology that's Christo christological reference because it is christ who is the victim who is being offered but he is also of course remember the priest he is the high priest whom the priest celebrate is acting in persona so it talks about a spotless an immaculate host and a, and a sacrifice then look at the offertory prayers of um uh, of, of the Novus Ordo Missae is anthropocentric. It's all about man, about what human hands have made. You know, it's except this which we have made, as opposed to we offer to you that which you, by your grace, gave us and perfected of us. It's completely the the ideology the ideologies are completely different. The philosophy is different. The theology is different. Fundamentally different, and that's this that's the problem here. So if you know, so for our perspective from tradition, is if you want to be saved, if you want uh, if you want to become a saint, all of the canonized saints currently, all of the canonized saints uh, of the church, even Paul the sixth, okay. I know, but even Paul the Sixth, all the canonized saints of the church thus far were all formed spiritually in their formative and impressionable years by the Tridentine Mass. It's the Mass they knew as they grew up, it's the Mass they knew as they were formed, uh, as their vocations were tested and discerned, um, as they were went through seminary, as they went through postulancy and novitiate, etc., um, and as they lived their lives. All of the canonized saints up until now basically have all been formed and come from that traditional latin mass spirituality perennial teaching of the church and the lex arandi um there is none so far no canonized saints so far um who have who are only 
brought up who only knew um, the Novus Ordo Missae. And again, if you look at the fruits, you know, if you, again, if we look at the um, Pew Research Survey results um, uh, in recent years, again, um, where is the fruit of Vatican II? Where is this rebirth? Where is this rejuvenation? Where is this revitalization of the church? The church which is dropping every year in numbers that significantly has dropped in vocations. Just compare the statistics between um, vocation levels prior to the council and after the council. Um, you know, this new order of mass has has done nothing but been destructive to the church. Look at the way it was implemented. Look at the millions and th hundreds and thousands of dollars that were wasted um, reordering churches and sanctuaries and chapels and all this bit, destroying what previously had been held to be sacred, destroying stone altar mensas that had been consecrated, that sealed in saints' relics in those old, hacked out, stripped off. All the viridoses, all the statues, all the icons, all the um, uh, murals, everything, everything that expressed through the ages the beauty um, of, of, of worship, uh, the beauty of art, um, the beauty of belief, um, of, and all the sacrificial giving, all the sacrificial, um, all the sacrifices made. Read those, read that art, and read the music, and read the the vestments, and the you know all those nuns in the in the 18th and 19th century who were um, um, you know uh, pricking their their fingers, creating Bruges lace uh, for the hours, and for those who were doing that beautiful needle point for um the the decoration of, of vestments um uh, and all the rest of it what of all that all of that was suddenly thrown out discarded thrown away there is no way you can say anyone can say that the novus ordo missi is expressive of the genuine lex orandi of the catholic faith throughout the ages it is not it is a complete rupture it is a com it is a, it is a complete um break annihilation and then read the vatican II documents i agree um as most um as many traditionalist catholic commentators agree 90 to 95 percent of what is in the vatican II documents can be interpreted uh in continuity not not necessarily having to use hermeneutics but in continuity with um, the perennial tradition of the church, for sure. But there is five to ten percent that is really dodgy, that is that is actually totally contradictory to what the church believed and taught before, or is at least dodgy and heretical. Is contains errors, and these have never been addressed. These have never been addressed, and so that we have, you know, it's, it's the. Um, uh, the example I gave uh, last evening, um, you know, Pope Francis signing an accord with a Muslim cleric um, to the effect that God wills all religions to exist. That is heresy. That is a heresy. It is error. God does not will all religions to exist. If he did, why would he send his only son? Why would Jesus say... No one can come to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. God does not will all religions to exist. He willed Judaism and Christianity to exist. Those are the two specific religions he willed to exist. All others do not come with divine approbation, no matter what they claim, no matter how much within themselves they may contain little bits of the truth. You know, no matter that they... You know, no matter that somebody who um, is brought up um, a really good Buddhist uh, could be a really nice person, could be somebody who doesn't lie, doesn't steal, doesn't cheat, um, is good to his parents, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. He may fulfill all of the Ten Commandments being supposedly a good Buddhist, but his Buddhism will not save him. If he is saved, it will be because of the generous mercy of God in Jesus Christ through his cross 
through Jesus's charity, sacrificial charity expressed upon the cross in his sincere desire that all souls be saved. A really good Buddhist may, but we don't know that. And as I've said before, we don't deal with doubt. We don't deal with what we don't know. We're supposed to deal with what is concrete and what has been made plain. And that is in scripture what has been divinely revealed as the faith. And that is, if you want to be saved, you believe in Jesus Christ. There's no other way. No other way. No other way to get to heaven except through Jesus. So, yeah, it's very interesting to opine you know oh well what if somebody you know what about the uh, tibetan buddhist monk who has never heard of the gospel never heard of jesus christ but has lived a good life on top of the mountain in tibet what about him well what about him what about him how does his situation in any way uh, relate to yours who have heard the gospel none what matters is your response to the gospel what matters is whether you or not whether you will be saved or not that is what matters sorry <laughs> no I'm, I'm not sorry for what i said <laughs> but i'm sorry if i i'm sorry if i max, maximize the uh, um the time <laughs> but this you see is this is what it's all really about now we could sit here the three of us and like all the other commentators we could sit here and say Oh, well, you know, uh, maybe Bishop Paprocki will, well, you know, maybe he'll um, get a yes or no back from the Vatican. Um, you know, well, maybe um, Archbishop Vigneron will, will um, uh, welcome Father Perron back with welcome arms. Or maybe uh, Bishop, um, uh, uh, what is his name? Um, is it Kalliner or, or Challoner or something like that? Um, maybe he'll be nice to, to Father Altman in the end. But, but we could all... We could all go, you know, we, we could all do that wishful and, 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 and you know, hope, um, uh, you know, what is it, Bishop Barron says, that we, you know, hope all things, whatever oh, yeah. it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, we could do that. But that's not going to save anybody's soul. That's not going to save anybody's soul. And the whole point of us commentating at all on anything like this, the whole point of any of you having a thought or opinion at all about any of this has to be about salvation it has to be about the salvation of souls it has to be about your salvation and it has to be about the salvation of your neighbor that's what it's all about that's what matters and as brother said last night what the bishop should do and especially all these bishops who are uh saying oh you know never mind what francis says you know carry on uh, we'll we'll sort it out actually what they should be doing is unifying as one voice turning back like paul resisting peter to his face and saying to francis you shut you can't do this it's wrong what you're doing and this is why it's wrong you don't actually have the authority to do this Papal infallibility doesn't give you the permission the authority to do this these things you need to understand properly what your job is what your role is and what our role is in respect of yours. And that is what needs to be worked out post Vatican II, because that wasn't settled at the Vatican Council. That wasn't settled at the Vatican Council. That's why Pope Francis thinks he can say, well, you know, as it says in, um, I don't know, um, Lumen Gentium, I don't know, um, uh, you know, or that the bishop has ultimate authority in his diocese for his liturgy, but you can't do anything without my say so that's that's not there you know it's and, and at the end of the day you see that it's about is it not about truth and untruth is it not about what's black and what's white is it not about um what is real and what isn't real what is real is the perennial catholic tradition of faith and exorandi that has saved souls and generated generations of saints that's what matters compared to a right that is um if not if it that is schismatic arguably in concept and certainly uh, uh schismatic by design and that has itself generated a schismatic attitude between those who want progressive modernist um theologies and all the rest of it and those who want the traditional 
Catholic faith as it has always been taught and believed and has produced generations of saints. Well, I'll let someone else speak. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, there's there's um there's not much to to add to that. Um, I mean, you talked about the the document with the Muslim cleric. Um, well, you know, it, Bishop it, Africa, it, Bishop Bishop Schneider even had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Pope Francis about that document and about that worrying phrase, and left that document a little bit left that meeting a little bit a little bit like Neville Chamberlain got off the plane back from Germany after his meeting with Hitler, waving a piece of paper saying, um, oh, we have peace, yeah? Bishop Schneider came back from his meeting one-on-one -on -one with Pope Francis about God wills other religions um, and said, oh, it's okay, we, we had the discussion, the Pope, yeah, he agrees with me, he agrees with tradition, he agrees that, you know, that's right, um, so everything's okay. What happened? <laughs> reiteration from the press office there will be no change made to the statement that was signed to the document that was signed with the with the islamic cleric <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah no it's um uh, you know that one gets a lot of a lot of coverage um but the one equally as bad if not arguably you could make an argument it's worse is the agreement which we don't know at least we know what's in the the muslim agreement um or whatever you want to call it, but uh, is the one with with China um, that he he sends over Mr. McCarrick, then Cardinal McCarrick, to do this secret deal with the Chinese, and what he um, in effect what he did was that he abdicated his pastoral authority as Pope over the the Catholics of China and handed that to atheists. Yeah. To atheists who want yeah. to destroy it. And he said, you know, I appoint bishops from, you know, and uh, you heard, if you watch yesterday's show, you heard some of the history with the old Roman Catholics and uh, the Pope wanting to appoint uh, bishops. And, and uh, but here, here you have, he's not, he can't appoint anybody um, in this situation that an atheist, an atheist government decides who will pastor the Catholic souls in China um, and sent to the Pope. The Pope yeah. goes, yes, sir, yes, sir. You know, it's, I, 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 and I don't know why, for the life of me, this is not being screamed from the rooftops. Um, exactly. So, exactly. So, you know, smell of the sheep, uh, you've got to be pastry sensitive. Uh, the Pope of mercy, mercy, mercy abandons the Catholics of China, abandons traditional Catholics. Who is he holy father of? Soon there'll be nobody left, apart from the 70-year-olds. <laughs> well, there won't be anybody left because all the people who, who give, all the people who care about whether or not there is a papacy um, and what it does, um, all the people who strive um, and I would, you know, and I would say, you know, the vast majority strive with the whole heart, whole mind, whole soul, whole strength to um, to worship God, to serve God, to adore God, to love God. Um, all these people are the ones who are being driven out. All these ones are the ones who are trashed. So who will be left? The people who change their mind, you know, every five minutes, depending on uh, the latest fashion, the latest zeitgeist, the latest whim, fancy, etc., etc. And how is that Catholicism? How can you turn, you know, I mean, if there's, if, there's, if there's one thing we Catholics have been traditionally known for is our obstinacy, you know, our stubbornness in what we believe and maintaining what we believe. It's that consistency, that constancy, <coughs> that continuity in tradition, in faith, in liturgy, in prayer that has, you know, made uh, the Catholic Church what it is and throughout all the centuries you know that is if you ask somebody what does the catholic church represent to you that they would say consistency constancy and continuity with tradition look at now now look now look at it now look at it yeah i mean it's it's crazy okay now trevor bless him and i know this is a question 
um, Brother Stanislaus that, um, that that you ask as well and, and Bishop Kelly referred to it earlier um, what are faithful Catholics um, supposed to do well, I'm going to shut up now and, and let, <laughs> let, I, I mean, I've got an answer but I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys <laughs> I'll let you guys answer that point what what can a traditional Catholic layperson do in this situation? What should they do in this situation? Go ahead, brother. Oh, um, well, you know, I think that that's a very, very difficult position because just kind of bouncing off what both of you have said, which, um, of course, I um, agree with, is that um, the the Pope has said who is Catholic, and apparently we're not, um, or we've got some we've got some time, due time, short time, to get on board if we want to remain Catholic. I mean that's what he's saying, and that if we stick to who we are, I don't know if he'll ever. You know, there, I have a, a theory about um, how the the traditional Mass is we can never be abrogated. Uh, no matter what anybody does. And many canon lawyers, many, they're coming up with this now. But, um, you know, the simple, I said this in our in our show yesterday, the simple thing you can do is just show up to Holy Mass, Latin Mass somewhere, every, as much as you can. All the devotions, um, go there and uh, protest in that way. Uh, however, I think, um, you know, Trevor is someone that watches a lot of our stuff and, and uh, pays attention. I don't know... Uh, where he is theologically, but what he mentioned about the left, right, blue, red thing, I think was pretty astute. And it's something that a lot of people recognize, especially over here in the United States, that we basically are seeing the same thing. Now, what is difficult, and I think what Trevor is pointing out, is that the difference is that with the left, right, red, blue thing here, it really is about choice. We are a country, that's why so many things have been allowed to happen, because we were a country founded on freedom. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to give freedoms to people that people like us don't agree with. But this is a secular society. That's why I've said to many people, we don't elect a saint. We're not looking to elect a saint. If you are, it's never worked. Um, we look to elect someone who can run the country. Now, as opposed to the church, <clears throat> it's different because the church is not a democracy, you know? And, and I know many Americans and maybe uh, many people across the world, they're formed in that way. Their mind is formed that I can choose what I want, I can decide what I want. You know, that's how we're formed here. It doesn't fall in line with traditional uh, Catholicism. And this is where I think the trick lies in that I keep talking about because all, of, all these years, the traditional Latin mass community was happy to go along to get along. Leave us alone, we'll leave you guys alone. Nova Sordo people, oh, yeah, they're crazy, kooky people over there, whatever. They're doing this, doing that. And so it's always kind of existed that way. Okay, as the both of you have, have rightfully pointed out, this is not something we can simply stand on the sidelines and say, oh, whatever. nah, it's okay, do what you want because he has drawn the line, Pope Francis. He has drawn the line. And now there is no choice. If we're gonna stay on this um, uh, rightful uh, theory regarding the most blessed sacrament, the sacred liturgy, there is no choice. And that's what I find in the circles I'm watching uh, and the one locally, even here in Detroit, the traditional mass circle, that's where they stop. That's where they're having a real problem right now because they don't want to appear to defy the Pope. And this is how deep this ultramontanism has, has gotten in, in the life of the, of, every, of the everyday Catholic. And why, and I think we're gonna have to address this soon. I don't, I'm not sure when or how. Why everyone listening, Pastor Aternus, we have to go back there. How long has it taken for them? All of the, uh, there's a word that I wrote down because it's important. It's a word that um, uh, Father, Father Ripperker 
uses and that I took from his teachings. It's called disappropriation. And both of you have kind of said what that is and what it is is where you give over uh, some rightful power that is yours. And typically in the spiritual life, that means that we're giving over something to the demonic. Uh, you know, we've heard these types of things. We create a throne for an attachment that we have. And it's true. And any attachment that leads us away from God, of course, is, is, is a demonic attachment. But that word can be very strong. But my point is, is that I think that there's an attachment uh, that's been formed in the minds of Catholics over the last hundred years. Uh, and, I, and let me use this, um, an evil attachment in the classical theological sense, an evil attachment to the office of the Pope. And it's coming out now because you cannot stand against this because it's the most blessed sacrament. It's a sacred liturgy, period. And I think, you know, I know I, I'm at fault as well for sitting on the sidelines all these years and not speaking up because it was that for many of us in the Novus Ordo Church. Well, let us do what we want to do and don't bother us, we won't bother you. And it's come to a head now <clears throat> and you're going to have to resist. So Trevor, um, to both of your questions, I think you're spot on. You've got it and I get your uh, what's going on in your heart that you're being pulled back and forth. But as, as uh, Archbishop has said, and as uh, Bishop Kelly has reiterated, the truth is the truth, period. And that's what Vatican II muddled up. It's what Vatican I muddled up. It's the last 150 years. It's coming to a T right here, right in front of us. And I'm gonna go, I go a little further in how I think of the office of Peter and what I think is going on. But the census fidelium is speaking up. Now, it's not going to really change anything from a law perspective as long as he's there. And I think that if we see him retire, which I still think is a possibility, it's because they want to make sure to get someone in that's going to continue his policies. If he dies in office, as you know, almost three quarters of the cardinals that are there have been named by him. There's no doubt in my mind, the next pope has already been chosen not by the Holy Spirit, but by these, whatever you want to call them, that have the power in Rome. So for the traditional Catholics who are uh, trying to figure out what to do, keep doing what you've been doing. Go to Holy Mass, receive the sacraments, go to confession, say an extra prayer for the Holy Father, and do it with the full intent of your heart, meaning that we want the truth. We're not talking about left or right. We're talking about the truth, and I think that's what the, the Archbishop was pointing out, was that this is where we have to uh, defy. And if someone could come up with a better word, I, I welcome it, but that's where, that's where we're at. You see, the, yes, absolutely, brother. Well, you know, what you said, absolutely. And the point is, one, one something I really want to, to make clear, um, and, and it's, for a minute, let's just think about... Um, uh, the Marian apparitions and, and messages of the last 150 years as well. Now, let, let's be clear. Um, Our Lady is not saying that she will save us. Mm -hmm. Our Lady is saying these are the tools you need to save the church. You must save the church because you are the church remember we as St Peter says in his epistle you are the living stones of the church the church is us we are the mystical body of Christ if we want to save the church what Our Lady in her messages has been saying is pray the rosary um, live a virtuous life be the best Christian you can be avail yourself of all the grace that heaven can ascend you receive the sacraments um, go to confession, um, live a holy life, um, pray the rosary and all, our, all these other prayers um, because they will help you to become holy and becoming holy will, you will receive the strength and the grace necessary to yourself save the church. Remember, um, you know, Father Thomas isn't with us, but remember he, he loves reminding us about um, uh, the seraphic father and um, 
uh, Francis and that message that 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 vocation that we received from <laughs> from God or well from the crucifix <clears throat> build my rebuild my church and Francis thought you know started rebuilding the physical church that was around him and then he realized oh no he means the church he means the physical body of Christ that the same is true for that's the same challenge to each and every one of us who are the living stones of the church do not think that just by don't do not think that just by tilling your rosaries and handing everything over to Mary that that's going to change anything it's not don't think that just by sacrificing intentions for sacramentals and sacraments for the benefit of benefit of the Holy Father or anybody else that that's necessarily going to change anything it's not what what is clear is that heaven has been telling us as heaven has always told us as divine revelation gives testimony to it's all about what you do it's about the decisions you make it's about the way in which you live your life it's the it's about how you respond to the gospel and whether or not you choose and live your life with your whole heart whole soul whole mind and whole strength for god or not this is this is really key because i hear so many catholics say you know oh well we'll just hand, we'll just give it all to mary we we'll just give it all to you know padre pio we we'll just give it all to that's not going to do anything guys if it is not married to your will to change and affect things yourself and crucial this is really crucial because what our lady has been saying all the time is personal holiness matters you need to be saints if you were all saints the world would be a better place if you were all saints the bad clergy would convert if you were all saints the world could be saved it's all on us yes we can turn to heaven for heavenly assistance we are promised we are assured all heavenly assistance and grace but the whole point of all of that is to empower us to enable us to facilitate us to effect the change that is necessary and it all comes down to conversion of life if i may just you mentioned saint francis and the the tumbled on church and the, the crucifix in the corner and he said francis build my church and francis well you know said okay and he started putting one stone above another this small little church you can go and see it today um it's, it's quite tiny it's one of those country little oratories that people would stop by if they were if they were walking towards a larger city um but you know as, as archbishop says um he started he started he heard the message and he built as it were the domestic church and um and we all have a role to play in that you know if if you're single you are your domestic church if you're a father you have certain duties to your family likewise the mother if you're a child you have the duty to honor your father and mother and listen to their wise counsel and the attack on the church the attack of modernism is on the family the family because they know if they can destroy the family they can destroy society they can destroy christianity you know our lord could have come into this world in any way that he chose you know blinding lights on, on a chariot descending all sorts of ways no the divine plan was for him to come in to a family and it is extremely important and if we build that domestic church if we save the family unit if we raise up our children to continue that and to build more families then that is and as francis then came to to um to realize in a dream he was uh, the pope of the, saw francis holding up the lateran basilica which is the cathedral church of the pope 
and indeed for many 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 centuries and still some good ones today have gone throughout the world um and and uh were great missionaries and have brought great uh, comfort and brought the gospel message to all corners of the earth and it all started with that small little tumble down church where francis listened to a message that message um the simple message the simple instruction soon became a movement that that changed the world and did we build the church did we form the church for a while um but you know i think that's very important um and we all are responsible uh, uh, to to have our own lives in order and to play our role in order you know for me it's my domestic church and the family that has been entrusted to me um but the same way we build the family whatever that looks like in your own life if it is an actual nuclear family rebuild it pass on that truth to your children shepherd them protect them against error nurture them god knows the world will attack them from left right and center prepare them and hopefully that will be passed on and i, I guarantee it that if if we restore the family if we protect the family the church will flourish because that's that's where it is our lord was born into a family yeah and don't forget the family of the church oh yes of course <laughs> you know no 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 but, but what i mean is is that you know as i as I often say um read the second chapter of acts of the apostles the description of the church the early church how the Christians behave with one another. They were a family. They were a family of families. You know, when they came together, <laughs> everyone came together. Um, and if there's one thing that is a stark contrast between um, the early church and the way we experience church today, is that we go to church and we are little islands. You know, we want as little to do with anybody else as possible. Now, don't mistake me, <laughs> don't mistake me, because I'm not saying that what Vatican II got right, for example, or the Novus Order Miss I got right, is that we should be all running around hugging each other. Um, I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. The point is, um, it's, a, it's about that, uh, the, feel, the filial adoption that we have in God as children of God, thus makes all of us brothers and sisters. I mean that's why you know, and that's why we refer to the heads head of the church family is the priest and he's referred to as father it all comes down to this family model now this is you know what Bishop Kelly has beautifully elucidated for us this is the issue today is that we have to in rebuilding the church today we have to build from the domestic church and remember that means the individual first so this is where our lady this is what our lady's been telling us about personal holiness because wh who are we what are we what does st paul say by virtue of our baptism we are we are temples of the holy spirit we're temples of the spirit of god we have the image of god within us like a temple has an icon within itself so we have the image of god within us so we in the first instance we are the first unit of the domestic church then by extension is our immediate family around us and our dependents then by extension again is our brothers and sisters in christ within the church and this is what we need to see and this is what we don't see in neither the novus ordo nor indeed the traditional catholic um, chapels and communities either that is no, a fundamental thing that has got to true. change that is a fundamental well, I, thing that has got to change and i would I would say which is what we i was talking about earlier that you know this is what worries me about you know the next family as you rightly say should be a thriving family is the parish and it's not it's 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 certainly dysfunctional dysfunctional these days <laughs> but it should be but see the insidious thing is that this document has pulled the mass from the parish of the ages from the parish yeah right. this, is, this is this is this is yeah this, it, it really worries me about about taking this from parishes uh, i've said there's the two things i think that are are blatant is taking it to the parish and and uh newly ordained priests and, but um stripping it from the parish um is and that's the agenda behind it 
Yeah. Yeah, you can slink off to your weird things, you know, you may have to drive two hours to it. But, you know, the parish we want is the, mm -hmm. the hugging and the kumbaya and, you know, uh, the coffee hour. Oh, yeah, a bit well, of religion in there too. And, but, um, and, the, and the point is as well, of course, is, and this, this is where the, all of this, this is why all of this is happening. It's because they have now got, they are now ruling the reins of the institution. They have got the power. That's what this is about. Well, yeah, that's they no doubt. They have got the power. <clears throat> But the point is, yep. the point is that as as ideologically perfect and you know doctrinally, um, the visible church should be both the institution and the mystical body. The point is, since Vatican II, we have not got that. No. That is what has been torn asunder or been teared, basically from the Enlightenment through to now. Sure. I think what you're both saying is, is going to um, help our community, the old Romans. I was just thinking that, you know, I, when I go to the SSBX parish sometimes, I still kind of get, I'm, I'm by myself. They're not, you know, I'm an old Roman, you know, they're still unsuspicious. But now I'm wondering how I'll be received. And it's probably going to be better, but I, I think that going back, I keep going back to Trevor because – even the left and right thing with the, what's going on the church lines up because the poor, um, it's more expensive now for them to get to good Holy Mass because if you do have to drive that two hours, hour, um, it's costing twice as much as it did just a year ago. And, and then I wanted to point out only because uh, the Archbishop mentioned private revelation and um, there is a bit of private revelation that uh, I think is uh, fits perfectly with what's going on, and you may have both heard of it. Um, it's with Sister Lucia of Fatima, and while there are many, many, many things in the diary of Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, the Most Blessed Sacrament, remember she was she took her name over the uh, of, of the Most Blessed Sacrament. So the things that she was told by our Lord and Our Lady were all about the Blessed Sacrament and some of this, some kind of what's going on. But Sister Lucia, uh, <clears throat> I believe it was later in her life, you know, she has what's called her um, final memoirs where she wrote everything down. And she had several uh, what she believed to be locutions, apparitions uh, from Our Lady, from the child uh, Jesus during her lifetime there in the convent. But what she wrote down, and I, I believe it was to Cardinal Bertone in explaining uh, the memoirs and all that. But she, she said, and remember to all of you, this is private revelation, but this is, I take it, it's very much how I've been formed, that the devil is in the mood for the final battle, which is going to be against marriage and the family. And she said, well, she wrote this down, I think, before the, the turn of the uh, millennium. And now, look, what are we talking about? Marriage and the family. And then even as the archbishop uh, has been talking about the domestic church, well, they're even taking the sacred holy mass out of church for the parishes. How can that be unless there's a real, real battle going on? Why else? Look, I mean, I know there's liberals and there's lefties in power in Rome, but why else would they would they do this? Except it is the most sacred thing on earth, and they're trying to snuff it out. And what is that? And I and I, I know that this is not the show to really approach those things, but it is important, I think, for all of us to think about, because woe to that generation that has to see these things and live through these things. And I pray to God that it's not us. But I will say this, Traditionis Custodis has reinvigorated me. And I feel very much like I'm putting armor on. And I can tell all of you, the three of us here, and you know it already, I the, what it's gonna take, and this, this is why I feel we, we you talked about vocations and your state in life and if you're single, if you're married. and Well, we're called in a special way. And 
this is our time. Not to, you know, in a sense, stand up and make videos and, you know, this is, we're going to buy. And this is our time. Put on your armor, fellow clergy. Put on your armor. We are, this is our responsibility. And we have to who? To the families who are screaming at us. Help us. Give us something. And it's going to get worse. The famine, that's what I think that's what we're heading for. A famine. And it started with the pandemic. And I, there's no doubt in my mind uh, who was at that big table deciding what was going to happen. And I think it's all coming clear now. It's all becoming very clear. It's simply that the formation, uh, the spiritual formation of Catholics over the last 50 years has been non-existent. And now they're being thrown to the wolves with that same spiritual formation. And it saddens me to no end because, you know, all they can do is flail. That's all they can do. And we as clergy out there um, trying to help them. And there's not enough of us. There's a story from um, uh, where I lived, a uh, very special place in my heart, Galveston, Texas. And Galveston, Texas is an island that sits about 80 miles off the coast of Houston. And um, it's where I lived for many years. And it's where I thought I was going to die. Galveston has a very old history. And the, um, uh, oh my gosh, the, uh, the name of the, the sisters who were there and who helped educate uh, all the kids in Galveston. Well, in 1900, in the year 1900, a huge hurricane hit Galveston. And you can go look it up. But well, we didn't have the communication that we did at the time, at, at this time, or even at when phones came around. There was nothing. So no one heard about it until after it happened. But what these sisters did, because the, they didn't even know the hurricane was, you know, this, the storm just came. And what, the, what they did, the way they found these beautiful nuns was with uh, rope tied around their waist. And then the ropes were linked and each the ropes were tied to children. And they, tie, and they tried their best to keep those children as close as they could to them, uh, hoping that the rope would help save them. And, and that's how they found uh, all of these wonderful nuts and the children. And so it reminded me of that, that that's, that's, what's been, we're, that's our responsibility. We have to go out and be available to these people um, who are going to start coming in droves. And very much like in Holy Scripture, where our Lord is tired and he doesn't want anybody, you know, it seems like where are all these people coming from? And I pray to God to help me because it's very easy to get a big head when stuff like that happens. And um, the answer is like I told Trevor and like I tell myself and I know is stay in the prayer book, go to Holy Mass, Go to confession. Stay, you know, live that life. At this point, you still have it. Keep doing it. Yeah. And as um, as we've been saying on Monday nights, I'll just give a quick plug. Um, Monday night, um, our uh, evening show then, same time, 6 o'clock, is the domestic church. Um, and specifically there, um, we try to give practical advice um, for the faithful. And, and this Monday, uh, we'll be answering particularly... Um, and addressing some of these points that have come up um, tonight. Um, I think we've, we, we, we're way over our usual time um, in terms of length of show. Um, viewers have not diminished, though, I have to, <laughs> I'm pleased to say. Um, bless you all. Thank you for watching. Um, we're here uh, next, next week, uh, same time, same place, uh, discussing the same things. Um, so don't forget, uh, Monday... 6 p.m. Angelus and the Domestic Church. Friday uh, next week, Angelus uh, and Brother Stanislaus um, and myself going through more of the Metropio. And then Saturday, same time, 6 o'clock, Angelus and then Old Romans Unscripted discussing 
well, doing more of this. Um, so we do hope uh, that you found this not only interesting but also useful um, as well as informative. Please um, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, you know, you can leave a message in the comments after the show um, or you can contact us uh, in the usual way via the platforms, private messaging, um, etc. Do feel free to do that. Otherwise, you can contact us through www.theoldroman.com www.theoldroman.com um, which we commend to you as being one of your first ports of call every day during the week to find out what the latest is uh, in the news uh, and what's happening uh, read the church and where also uh, you can find uh, the daily mass the traditional latin mass uh, the, and, uh, the rosary and uh, meditations and the angelus um, and all those other things designed and supplied to help you to enable you to be the best Catholic Christian you can be, which is what heaven desires us to be. Um, so let us avail ourselves of all those heavenly graces and all that heavenly assistance that is promised us. Um, all we have to do is just try to be the best we can be. With that in mind, um, I shall ask uh, Bishop Kelly if he'd be so kind as to give us his blessing uh, that we may receive this first bout of heavenly grace as we seek to go forward uh, in faith from this program the lord be with you and with thy spirit. and with your spirit may the blessing of almighty god the father the son and the holy ghost come upon you and remain with you forever amen amen, amen. well amen. it's goodbye from me it's goodbye from them <laughs> We've, we've got to rehearse that. We, 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 we've got to get that, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> we, will, we will see you all online shortly. Take care. God bless.